Tenemos una no mesa redonda de lujo. So, this is the non round table panel because we've evolved. This is not a round table session with different stakeholders uh, from our industry uh, to try and give us a clearer picture of what's going on in this very complex scenario. The uh, Producers Federation, PROA, uh, not just Catalonia, but uh, uh, also the Balearic Islands and um, Valencia and uh, Sicily as well. This is my second joke today, by the way. So, uh, PROA has been organizing this session for uh, quite some time so that uh, we can understand, better understand uh, the current situation and uh, try to uh, be proactive and envisage what things might look like in the future. And uh, we want this to be a two-way street. We would like this session to be interactive. So uh, please uh, prepare questions or comments for later. Because this is an international festival, uh, I'm going to start in Spanish, but uh, we will be listening to English. Uh, you can also speak in Basque, in the Basque language. Uh, there, there is simultaneous interpretation. And uh, language should not be a barrier uh, in an international festival. So we will be using different languages. Right. Uh, I think it's probably time we got started. Co-producing in Europe, two complex terms uh, by definition, co-production and Europe, right? Why uh, am I saying they're complex uh, labels? Co-production is changing. We now have new players in this game, new uh, funding schemes, new uh, financing stakeholders. And I was talking to Alexander earlier on, and uh, we were saying it's a little bit dramatic, all of this, all these changes. There are uh, producers uh, who still think uh, co-productions will save the day of uh, independent films, whereas uh, other producers say co-production makes no sense anymore. That's what we are here to talk about. Uh, do we need to change what in the world of co-production? Do we need uh, to update uh, what we do? And then Europe. Uh, that's a fairly complex uh, label, right? With um, extreme nationalism in Eastern Europe, in Belgium as well. Uh, things have been changing in that sense, and um, Europe, certain areas in Europe, seem to be seem to become more and more territorial. I'm going to hand the floor over to our experts. Uh, I have here with us, we have here with us Silvia Noor. And also uh, Oife O'Sullivan uh, from Sobotica uh, Entertainment in Ireland. Ireland is one of the best territories for co-production, and she will explain how and why. Uh, bang in the middle, uh, you can see Alexander Bohr uh, from ZDF Arte, uh, the German channel uh, that has been involved in co-productions uh, for a very long time with many different countries. Uh, they're very good at harmonizing different uh, angles and different positions. Uh, then we have uh, the producer from Fasten Films, Spanish, uh, but uh, with a lot of experience in the international market. And last but not least, Martin Lukáš, uh, who's uh, uh, leading New Europe, New Europe Film Sales, a very interesting agency, sales agents, uh, boutique sales agents in Poland. They specialize in finding the jewels of the crown, those very special gems uh, at a very early stage. 
So I'm going to hand uh, the floor to them. And I would like to ask you to please uh, try and uh, give us some highlights about how you see the current scenario, just very shortly, initially. Good morning. I work for ICEA, ICA. In my department, uh, we're in charge of approving uh, international co-productions and uh, we um, support uh, projects. Uh, I totally agree with David's uh, first introduction. introduction. Uh, there are new stakeholders in the platforms, not just in co-production, but also uh, the contracts uh, that uh, used to be signed with TV stations quite st straightforwardly. Well, now it's different contracts with platforms or uh, for international sales in those platforms. Regulations uh, are lagging behind. Uh, we know how laws are slow uh, when it comes to change. So uh, reality tends to be like three years ahead of uh, laws and regulations. Uh, in Spain, uh, we continue to work with co-productions. Hemos aumentado las coproducciones con Europa hasta hace poco. In fact, uh, we are now doing uh, more, uh, more co-productions with Europe because in the past uh, our natural uh, co-production partners were in Latin America. I have here some um, facts and figures. And for general co-production, uh, out of 45 uh, applications, 17 are for international co-production. Uh, co uh, out of 259 selective co-productions, uh, 79 are uh, for co-production and 34 for uh, Europe. On average, we're talking about a, a budget of some, uh, which is far higher than uh, the budget uh, of co-production with Latin America. I've been uh, witnessing this change uh, that's been happening for three, four years now. Uh, we've gone from co-producing with Latin America and now with Europe. Por la, tra la tradición nuestra siempre es pensar que hacemos más con Latinoamérica, pero hay un cambio de tendencia ahí sí. muy interesante. Y será bueno esto. Eh, Hi, I'm very sorry. I'm going to have. Bueno, eh, have any choice. Um, I have no Spanish, so I don't want to uh, punish you by trying. Um, so I'm from an Irish company, Sabotica. Uh, we've been going for about 20 years, over 20 years now. Um, so, as David said, lots of experience in, in co productions internationally. Um, we've done co-productions with Spain in the past, with David, in fact, um, uh, very happily. That was a really good experience. Uh, we've done co-productions with Canada. There's a strong Irish-Canadian uh, co-production treaty that works really well. We've done about four of those. We do a lot at the moment with Scandinavia. Um, it's just turned out that way over the years, mainly because Scandinavians, they don't have a strong tax credit culture. Um, so they come over like the Vikings used to a long time ago and come to Ireland and other countries to get their tax credits. Mm -hmm. um, so we work with all of the Scandinavian countries. At the moment, we're doing a lot of TV, um, which is quite new for us in Sabotica. We've been doing feature films, independent feature films, uh, for, for most of our 20 years. Uh, but just in the last two, three years, we've been doing a lot of TV. I think a lot of people are doing that because of you know, the changing landscape and the new platforms and content is required all of the time um, for all of these different platforms. And so it just makes sense to be providing content for both film and TV at the moment. Um, you know, you'd be crazy not to. Um, so Ireland is thriving at the moment. We have a good tax credit, it's 32%. Um, we have really good crews, we're busy all the time. Um, we have you know good locations, the only thing we can't do is um, beautiful desert type um, landscape. So, you know, working with Spain is actually a really good thing because we, we can't, you know, we have lush green landscapes and mountains and woods and all of that sort of thing. We do have beaches, but the sun rarely shines on them. Um, so yeah, working with Spain is, is really good in that way. If a script needs, you know, a hot country. Um, 
and we've sometimes we're working on a project actually at the moment that uh, features African scenes, and we're probably going to do that with Spain, I think. Oh. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's also Screen Ireland, um, which is the national uh, funding body, um, and then there are regional incentives as well in Ireland. Um, so if a project is, is more Irish, say, than, um, than anything else, then it, it, there are more uh, incentives available. Um, we also have, like you guys do here, we have uh, our local language, um, the Irish language, um, and there's funding available for that as well. So yeah, it's, it's a busy time. Um, it's a busy time and it's a good time to be working in Ireland. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, una, una simple clarificación para los que no estéis... I would like to clarify something uh, for those of you who don't know about Ireland. Uh, they have tax incentives, the so-called 481 standard uh, or norm, which is a very simple way of uh, collaboration. And uh, as I said, it's ever so simple. Um, accessing those incentives. Then thinking about uh, films and projects that need uh, more content, uh, that is more Irish in content, then they have a committee uh, examining content and finding um, fortes, finding um, Best, better partners. So uh, they're very industrial and competitive uh, in one of those um, ways uh, to uh, co-produce two different channels. Alexander, next, next please. My name is Alexander Bohr. Um, I work out of uh, ZDF for the cultural channel Arte. And, um, First, I want uh, to thank the festival for inviting me here to this beautiful place. I've been here before and I always enjoy it. Um, it's, it's difficult uh, to say what we are really aiming for, but uh, to make a, a long story short, um, uh, we try to help a little bit as a broadcaster to keep uh, something what we call art house cinema alive. We do that in uh, three ways. Um, first is acquisition, that's our main field. And then we do pre-sales and uh, uh, the third one is co-productions. And uh, these co-productions are that we do are all or mainly European films that we support. And uh, that's, uh, well, if you want more detailed information, we will have a lot of time later on. It's just a, a first. Yeah, because actually you've co-produced um, three Spanish movies with uh, Nostromo, is that possible? Well, but that was not, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that was uh, together with the main channel, okay. which is a, quite a rare opportunity because the ZDF main channel is, let's say, more uh, commercial, large audience oriented. And um, uh, we are co-producing for Arte, uh, um, especially in the, in the field of art house cinema. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Adria. Good morning. Thank you for coming nice and early today. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Fast, Fast and Films, our production company in Barcelona. Let me just uh, give you an idea. Uh, we have uh, the attorney, the judge, and the spy, a TV series with co production with us, a German producer with ZDF, and Movie Star. Well, I just wanted to give you that example uh, that those things can be done. Uh, 
But we need to be creative. We need to think hard. Uh, Co-productions ideally should be nice and easy uh, and romantic, but they're not. Uh, I think we have to wake up and realize that in Europe uh, we have a lot of fortes, a lot of strengths, and we shouldn't waste time to try and uh, apply to every single fund in every territory. I think we sometimes forget about content, which is basic. Uh, just make sure that you have good content, a good project, make sure that it will work in your territory, and then whatever comes over and above that, fine. Because we sometimes have projects uh, submitted to us, and I, I sometimes think, what can we contribute to this? Because there is no system here for minority subsidies or funding, uh, which was the case, for instance, uh, between us and Portugal. It's, it's a shame, uh, and maybe we should make the, mo the most of that, of minority co-production chances. Danish is also really bad, so I'm going to do it in English. Uh, I come from Poland, which is sort of quite exotic for the sales business, because the majority of them are based in France and Germany and UK. Uh, we've been doing art house films for already six years. We've been working a lot with Scandinavian films. It's mainly because of our film that we have called Rams, which was a big hit everywhere. So we started to work a lot with Scandinavia first and Eastern Europe a lot because where we come from as well and recently also we uh, got more into Latin American and Spanish market mainly as always we feel because of the success of one film because we did the Spanish Catalan film Summer 93 by Carla Simon so because of that we started to have so many projects coming from the market and everyone says it's another Summer 93 but I think it's really hard to repeat <laughs> Uh, one film, and we also recently joined the game with the co-productions because they, there were changes. I mean, we have a minority scheme in Poland right now, which has been working for four years, I think, because before we only had like Holocaust films coming to Poland because of the locations, so all these big Holocaust films were coming, uh, but we had no system to co-produce. Right now, it's quite wealthy. I would say we co-produce with the whole Europe, Latin America, Asia. There have been co-productions with Chile, Brazil, Kazakhstan. Like, all, like there is no regulations. We don't have many treaties, so majority of the co-productions are outside of the treaties, mm -hmm. which is fine for our fund so far, because I think we have five or six treaties only uh, signed. And the, the Polish market, it's really the funding is really based on the Polish Film Institute. But also, for us, when we go into co-production of sales and trying to, uh, we do also a lot of gap financing. That not only with NMG, but also we're looking for mm -hmm. for partners. So it's whether it's equity or pre-sales, or we have partners in different schemes that we can bring, not necessarily from Poland. So because the Polish system, for instance, on the, the televisions, the only do on the pre-sale side, they only do the Polish content, Polish language content. They don't pre-buy like an art house dramas. Uh, so both national television or even the pay TV. Uh, yeah, and I think it's quite exciting with Poland. I mean, it's, we have a lot of art house channels. The art house scene is quite big. Also the platforms are super active because it's a 40 million country. Uh, plus there's like 20 million Polish speakers abroad, including Ireland. <laughs> uh, so everyone is quite active, so I think it's a super good times for mm -hmm. the Polish producers. I think that's my feeling. Yeah. Good. Um, yo me quedo con varias cosas que habéis mencionado. I would like to just go back to a couple of things you've mentioned during your initial in presentations or introductions. My first impression is that uh, we are definitely in a changing world, uh, in a game where the rules are changing, and yet uh, co-production, uh, if efficient, can help us survive. We are uh, finding uh, good ways to work with Europe, we're all saying that. And uh, two points uh, I find important. One, reciprocity amongst uh, different countries, and the other one uh, would be the minority-majority 
um, co-production at the so-called Brexit summit. You know how the UK seems to preempt life. So they changed to change their convention, their party convention, so that uh, the rules of the game can be much more flexible, so that Europeans can co-produce with Canada, South Africa, uh, Australia, or Latin America without the need for bilateral treaties. Huh? Is that dangerous territory or what? Well, well. Then. Uh, the share uh, doesn't need to be 20 or 10 uh, anymore, but it can come down to 5%. Those are the new rules they've set in their game. I just wanted to launch that. Uh, the UK tends to be uh, very uh, creative and uh, clever with new proposals. If they're doing this, do you think if we want to be competitive in this very complex scenario, should be being more flexible and being more, shall we say, European? Well, from the ICAM, we are working on several fronts. Or we, we would, would like to, to one, one on the tax incentive to enhance uh, shootings of uh, foreign teams in Spain or, uh, or uh, considering the new, the new taxes, the, the, the tax incentives for the, for the, for the uh, uh, companies that produce in Spain. On the other hand, we would like to, to change where this uh, law, royal law, where that, it, that deals with the co-production, and we'd like to, to modify it, to adapt it to the changes, and we'd like to work with the with the sectors in order to this change to adapt to the needs, to the current needs. We, and we are aware of this pressure for funding, the, so that funding not only go to the major co-productions, but also to the minority ones. So in all this uh, resume of, of things, we will have to find the point where we can adapt to the law, and, and being aware that the, while, by the time we do this, the, 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 fear, the cinema will always be far ahead, will, will be far ahead. But uh, what you were saying about the United Kingdom, co-productions are being approved uh, according to uh, international agreement and with the, with the U U UK is the co European co uh, Convention, not, and independently of uh, Brexit or not. And we have bilateral uh, agreements with certain countries. Obviously, we have to be agree between, between us, not only to change on our side, our law, but it has to lead to changes in other countries in Europe and bilateral agreements, which, which are also difficult to m modify, and also European agreements have to be coordinated, because if we pass uh, co international co-productions in Spain, and if we uh, spread them, communicate them, oh, I'm, I'm mixing a few subjects here, but uh, about coordinating, uh, coordination between us, we, 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 we approve our, our coordination with, with the country and we communicate it. So this approval of this, com this agreement, we immediately communicate it to the country where we are going to co-produce. And we need this reciprocity and sometimes this doesn't happen. We need those countries to communicate us if, to communicate to us if they approve, if they pass this, this coordination. And, uh, and we, we need to coordinate this because sometimes we have approved past uh, co-production and a year further the, 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 the film comes to get their nationality. But afterwards the country, the co-producing country communicates us that they don't approve the, the co-production. So we find ourselves with situations like this or a very advanced uh, a film in a very advanced state and the other country doesn't approve it and according to the agreements if both countries are not uh, not agree or approve them this uh, the, the, the film just can't go any further and regarding brexit the single problem is the the, the, the british staff if they as they have as now if they can work as a 
Spanish stuff, because they're European stuff. Uh, if finally Brexit uh, happens, hard break happen, happens, a, a film, uh, for instance, of uh, co-production with France, but with uh, because of Spain, there will be British uh, staff. Those they will, if if there is Brexit, there will ha be extra communal community uh, staff, and and this will have an, an incidence. They have an, an influence, so we have to coordinate amongst all of us. You do. Well, first of all, I have to say I don't care where a script comes from. I don't care. If it is um, a unique, interesting story, is it worth to be told? And um, if it's a regional story or a local, even a local story can be universal and understood by everybody. And that's our starting point is the, is, is the script. You know, and all our decisions um, uh, in, the, in the first stage are based on the script. And, um, and then we are trying to help to develop to f further drafts and so on. And um, if there is only, let's say, uh, a, a Portuguese film and there is only a Portuguese producer, um, sometimes we help to bring a German co-producer on board and um, it opens up other uh, opportunities to get funded in Germany or even though the film is shot entirely in, in Portugal. So our, our main issue is to bring this thing alive, to help the film uh, to be made and, and uh, to help to give uh, opportunities for, for uh, co-productions. I think it's, it's, it's necessary to, to talk more about content and not so much about tax rebate here and there. And of course, this is very important. And, and, and the second step to, to really find the, the, the best mixture of, of countries that, comes, that come together uh, on, on, a, on a film project. Yes, I totally agree with Alexander. I think the, the story, uh, finding a, a story that works is the main thing. It doesn't matter where, where they come from, like, like Max was saying, uh, he can have a film in Catalan and, and sell it in, 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 in Polish. And this, and this is something that a country like the U.S. lacks, diversity. You can tell different stories, diverse stories, and something is, this is something unique that we have in Europe. And, and, and and it's something difficult to find ever elsewhere. There's a lot of talent with a little bit of funding and, and not only money, but just uh, adapting the regulations. We have time, we have time to, to wait for the ideal conditions, but in, we have produced with Ireland, with Germany, with even a minor, minor co-production with uh, Polish, and we talk we, about the content, we see the possibilities of what can be done in in Ireland, uh, we had a, a tax, tax, tax shelter, a pre-sale. With, with, we had a post-production agreement with Poland. You talk with someone, and then things go on. When, when I try to explain what we can provide, what we can bring to the game, is to, to bring lots of uh, passion and illusion. And then in the end, you have your own project as a major, major uh, partner. You have some cases, instruction, distributors, but if your project is ma a major project or m a minor project, and honestly, it's difficult to know how you, how, you, how you do each one of them depending on. But I believe in, in the value of Europe, I, even, even though the situation is a bit of it depressing in many aspects now, but the potential is that with uh, four solutions to little problems, we could... We, we could we could do we could be uh, the, the future could look bright and there's a lot of potential like this 
like this de debate board, which is simpler than what it looks at in, in the first place. I completely agree with the panel that the story is the starting point, the story is the main thing. Um, but I think it's important to say too, when it comes to co-production treaties, you know, you can do it in two ways, and I've done it in both ways over the years many times. You can do it officially under co-production treaties, or you can do it without the treaties. Now, obviously, in Europe, we have the European Convention on Co-production Treaties, which is really good. Sometimes, you know, if you've worked with a company before and you've worked with a certain country before, maybe you think that that's an extra layer of administration that you don't need. You know, it's very time-consuming, um, and it's quite restrictive in some ways. But, on the other hand, I think if you're working with a country or with a company that you haven't worked with before, it can be really advantageous and it can protect you. And I find that particularly as a European working with countries outside of Europe, um, with America particularly. I don't know if we have any American friends here, but it can be, they don't really have the same type of uh, co-production uh, culture that we have in Europe. Uh, it's a very different way of making films over there. As, as we all know, a lot of private equity, and it's just structured very differently. They don't have the state bodies and, and the tax credits. They have like, regional tax credits, but they don't have the same co-production structure that we have here and that we're all used to. And so I find sometimes when our American friends get involved in co-productions, they don't see it in the same sort of democratic way that we do here. Um, and so it's better to have those co-production structures in place uh, to, protect, to protect companies. So that's what, for me, that's what it's good for. But if, you know, if you're working with people you've worked with before, to be honest, it's just an extra layer of paperwork that you probably don't need. Yeah, it's, I mean, with the US, it's a completely different game, which I like. I think it's a sort of uh, understanding of our system. And for us, when we were working in the US, I think it helps a lot to also look for our system from outside with the questions that they have. It's always very inspiring to look at the regulations that they, that they look at us in a way. But it was also about the content. For us, it's the most important. We have this expression in the office, and I think a lot of people use that in the sales business. That the project's called Euro Pudding. And this is one of these projects that you know that this script has been sent everywhere, and there is a character for five pages who's traveling somewhere to Europe. So for them, it can be Denmark, Germany, Poland, wherever you get the money, and then people know exactly what kind of systems are they, and we call it Euro Pudding, because for me, this project usually, it's a super bad start for me with the pitch, if they have, you have this character who travels, or this foreigner who comes to the resort, it can be from France, we can cast Isabelle Huppert or whatever, or it can be from Poland or the Germany and whatever, and you always be like, this is like the worst case if you really don't care where the character comes from or what it represents. For me, it's always the, the worst. It's usually, I don't even try to read such projects if I don't like the story or something, but it's, it's always like the starting point that I just want to turn down the meeting very quickly. And especially now, because Poland got the tax incentives this year, so we got a lot of this kind of like, oh, we have this project, you know, it's happening in the woods, you have forests, so can we do it? And we're like, but wait a minute, I think our forests are different than yours and all of it. So yeah, it's an interesting also to look at this when you have this, you know, because we have incentives which are almost like 50 million euros. It's a lot of money being floated to the industry. And it was like, you yeah, know, well, let's try to get it in the way I would never think about. I think it's very interesting your reflection about how how the Europe pudding could be av avoided, or, and the Europe pudding is something that is not natural, not organic. We are going against the uh, the content that we, Alexander mentioned before. How how could we avoid this? There's a formula that the uh, Commission editors, some of you have must have worked uh, with them with either from broadcaster or from institutions, public institutions. They have, there's a person that assesses you, helps you to the process until the process is uh, uh, far developed. Have you had an experience in that sense, Adrian, maybe? 
Thank you. Um, bueno, tengo experiencia yes, well, I have, a, I have my experience is more with uh, foreign politicians who would do the pitching to their distributors and broadcasters, and we have co-developed from the beginning. We have had with sales agents or sales uh, companies talking how the product is, not as much with co producers, and trying to avoid Europe puddings, even though the, the, the idea is that sometimes you need to spend something or to, 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 to make compromises either with funding or, or, or actors. And uh, if the stories are local and it's stories that travel and, and maybe it's the team, you, you, you need to have maybe a, 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 a Dutch actor that lives in, in Madrid and has a Peruvian uh, neighbor or from Kazakhstan and some, suddenly it doesn't make sense and this is something, a, a, current, a situation that we find currently sometimes with, I've done films that with, where this hasn't really worked. This, is this something that you regularly, this a situation that you find, uh, the diversity of, of territories and origins? I always get, uh, I have to say, I always get suspicious when a producer is approaching me and telling me that the story takes place in, let's say, in uh, Finland and uh, goes to Italy and um, uh, he proposes me uh, to cast uh, for the main character a German actor. Then I always think, well, mm, this is maybe not the right, uh, the right film for me um, because uh, we don't have this only um, in European films. We even have the same problem in German films. We have the regional funds in Berlin, in uh, North Rhine-Westphalia and so on, Bavaria and all the road movies uh, uh, the German road movies, they travel through the country just to collect the funding and, and it's not really uh, um, uh, driven by, by, the, by, by the story of the, of the film. The, the, the story is built for the, for the funds. And uh, yeah, so um, uh, we usually um, avoid that kind of, of uh, project. So is this something you, you find usually? We, yes. Uh, in fact, we, we find this kind of project that they need funding and they come looking for uh, funding and they adapt the project to the financing. And well, naturally, the project would have to be the, the, the project that you want to do, work with the, the screen play that you want to do, and then look for a funding, not create the project around the funding. But yes, uh, tax exemptions and incentives in Spain don't work as they should have. And, and, this, and there's no support in looking for financing abroad. Uh, the, the, you need to, to find a way of doing it, co-production, because co-producing with a country is not being just desperate and doing whatever. It's good to be open to other countries, to co-production, to have uh, European actors or non-European actors that provide that, 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 that add to the project, but we like we have to fit in this freedom of a producer of a filmmaker to do a project that where he believes in, but who also have uh, international sales support and also has uh, national finan finance not, uh, not or in a country or in any other countries to just just to make the the project go further. But the problem is there's so many regulations, so many different institutions, and it's very complicated to coordinate all of this. But we have to find a way to do it. Moreover, we have to, to, to see that there are producers who have uh, very good experiences in co-production with other countries, and we have to find a way of uh, making them share their experience of how they have uh, they have obtained a contract, how they have contact a specific co-producer, 
and uh, in Europe this is probably easier but in in countries outside of Europe sometimes you have to you have to make the most of other co-producers which already have experience in co-producing in these countries to help other producers that could possibly uh, learn from their experience so in between all of us, we have to we have to to help each other, not only with uh, institutions, public institution, but the players in the sector, and share our experience and coordinate it and, and adapt it to some regulations that necessarily have to has to exist because tax incentives require a specific nationality because nation, uh, uh, funding requires a specific uh, a national uh, staff. And or European because you have you go, you're not going to give funds to to somebody a team that doesn't belong to your territory. So in this end, we have to find a way for projects to have uh, to to be uh, the source by the, the good quality, not not to turn evolve around funding. So that's the idea. That's our idea, and and that's how we would like to work. I'm I'm, I'm very. I'm very interested in the idea, um, Eva's idea, that sometimes we use the treaty and other times we don't use the treaty when there's a chance of not doing so. For instance, I come here to the uh, co-production forum, a, a marvelous forum with be beautiful projects. Uh, well, this, this, I'm totally in love with one and that I, I, come, I, I, I knew, I found about it yesterday, and I'm, I have not closed it. There's 40 people be, before me that have uh, making off of them. And, and there's chances where you could, you know, you could be a good producer for that project. You say, okay, I don't, I'm, 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 I'm not, I don't agree to the treatment, but I can provide something. So this flexibility to enable this opportunity. For instance, uh, Haneke, as a, as, a, as a director, I would kill to do a film with Haneke. Please don't. Don't 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 say what I just mentioned, but there's a chance, and you can you can grab it. You have you have reached this point in Ireland. You have done this, and you have created an identity. We know perfectly well what a, a f Irish film or an Irish content film is. How is your relationship with uh, funding, with co-producers? It's fully in Ireland. Uh, oh, in it's fully, um, English language. Uh, European country left, soon to be, after the 31st of October. Um, so we don't have the same uh, experience with Euro Puddings, for example, because, you know, it's mostly English language films that come to shoot in Ireland. Um, and we do get some Euro Puddings, you know, and, and if they're organic, we would welcome them. But in Ireland, we're a small country, so I think it's very important for us. We're only five million people. It's important for us to protect the industry not in a protectionist way, but, you know, just to make sure that the money is spent in the right way. And so Screen Ireland are very careful about that, for example. Um, the tax credit's automatic, you know, it doesn't matter where you're from or who you are, everybody gets the tax credit once they're working in Ireland. But with Screen Ireland, they have two different types of funds um, for feature film. They have the creative co-production fund, which you can get up to 300,000 euros. And that can be a story that's based elsewhere as long as it's a proper creative co-production and, you know, you use crew and you spend a certain amount of money in Ireland and, you know, all of that. And then you can get a bigger fund that's up to a million, I think, if it's an Irish originating project. So that's how Screen Ireland protects the Irish film industry, that there's more money made available for, for Irish films, films that are written and directed by, by Irish people. And they can be co-productions as well, obviously, but they have to be originated in Ireland. Um, but everything, because we are a small country, everything that we do is a co-production now. Uh, there's very few, you know, maybe a local TV soap or something will be made just for Ireland. But nearly everything has to be a co-production because there isn't enough money in Ireland to, to do feature films and, and, you know, ambitious TV drama just in Ireland. Um, so we have really good links now that we've established um, all over Europe in particular, but all over the world um, to make co-productions. There's something I really liked you said. You said we tried to protect the industry but not being overprotective. It was something like that. It was a, a good philosophy, I thought. Um, Alex, uh, he's like my guardian angel. And I was talking, we were talking 
only recently, and uh, we were saying how important it is uh, to spend and invest taxpayers' money in the best possible way, right? Uh, so that taxpayers uh, feel good then when they watch something where their taxes uh, have partly been invested. So you protect not being over protectionists. And let me just tell you a story. We, I was uh, filming in Ireland uh, and uh, I was working with I IFA there. And uh, it was amazing. We couldn't find Irish technicians. They were all taken. And some of the Spanish uh, members of our crew, um, they got good offers uh, in Ireland, and, and they were going, wow, if I, if I make the decision to go and live in Ireland, I would be earning twice as much as I earn in Spain. Well, uh, that's probably similar over here in the Canary Islands in Spain. But it's, it's great. Uh, I mean, you, you protect uh, your industry and protect uh, taxpayers' money, but not being overly protect, uh, protectionistic. Unless one of you has something to say, I was thinking of you, Martin. Uh, we have new players in the market, and originally uh, the idea was uh, co-production so that uh, it could uh, access, the project could access funding from different territories and so that then supposedly distribution would also happen in different countries. But you know how some distributors go straight to the largest platforms and anything outside those platforms is dead. Uh, how are you facing uh, these difficult times, you? I think everyone just said, I mean, within the sales agent, they're just saying, like, oh my God, we're not going to be that important anymore because the sales agent has been a very important player in the industry for many years. And the game has changed a little bit. And I find it quite fascinating that, especially on the producer side, you have more partners to work with. You know, everyone just talking about the platforms and everyone just using these names as the enemies. And, and I feel that for producers, I think it's one of the partners, it's a different. Uh, source of money, because I think what we have been facing as a sales agent is like the producers are getting less and less money in their home countries, so they're having more bigger and bigger gaps in the financing, meaning that they're coming to us for bigger MGs for, to cover the gaps, but at the same time the distributors are paying less and less because less people go to theaters, it's getting harder for the art house films, so there was like sort of a ba uh, like imbalance between that and I mean we work with platforms as well, it's always a, a question whether we need it or not, or the filmmakers need it, because especially for a lot of filmmakers that we work with as an art house scene, it's quite important the theatrical experience, but often you don't have that chance. You have a film that we have, I don't know, at Sundance or in Cannes, in, you know, you sell 10 territories and they just in the cinemas for one week or two weeks, and that happens, you know, it's, there are a few art house films which are really making money in a way that they broke even with all MGs and expenses. So I think it's always, with, with every film we just have a discussion with the filmmakers. Let's say if the platform is coming, whether it's Netflix or Disney or whoever coming now, we are completely open to it. Although we know that, you know, there is more and more producers having a relationship with the platforms and they don't need us because we're still a sort of a middleman. And I don't find it bad. I mean, I think it's quite fascinating times for, of course, we are getting cut off with a lot of deals, but I think it's, it's only an advantage for the content creators, in my opinion. I don't see it as a, you know, I don't see them as enemies, like a lot of people would like to see them. And all these fights with festivals and all of it, I do not understand because we really poorly believe that the content is the king and I don't care where it comes from, who made it, what is behind, or all of it. It's, if the story is good and the film is good, it just, I don't care. Whether it's a 16 years old student made it on iPhone or it was 40 million platform film. As long as it's good, I think. Mm. A very interesting comment. 
And I was thinking about opportunities, how uh, this is an industry, uh, it should be, we should have good business sense. And I remember that I once saw a script uh, written by a Norwegian uh, to be directed by an American uh, to be uh, shot partly in Sweden and partly in the US. And we were coordinating all of that. And it took us some like three years to coordinate it. And when the director was free, uh, um, Amazon said, oh, you can do it all and uh, we'll do it all. We'll do away with the producers. Can you imagine? The film will be made. Uh, I will only be a line producer, not a real producer. And I think that's uh, happening more and more. And I think that uh, it should be an eye opener for sales agents. I think we, we've been sitting as a sales company in the very comfortable seats for many, many years. Like we've been the ones who are protecting the producers, but also the ones who have a lot to say. And I think now the whole sector is getting challenged. And I think it's only, that's the way a lot of sales agents enter corporate actions or they setting up the financing arms and all of it and the, the flirting. And we also do flirt with the US market and the agencies or the equity partners. And that, we were not even thinking about it five years ago, you know, because we, we thought that it's, we're gonna rock the world with all this art hosting, but it's not, and this is often, what I found interesting that there is a lot of discussions, for instance, right now, because of the platforms and the bigger players that often we get the script or a project, and then there's always a discussion whether it can be an English language film. And that's a question that we're getting from the platforms a lot saying like, can we do it in English? And then of course they mentioned Ireland. Let's do that with Ireland or let's do it with UK with Film 4 or one of the financing bodies and let's go to the agency to finance it together because the financing, the American or anglo sas financing is different. I think it's mainly based on Skypes and calls rather than filling up the applications that we know in Europe. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it's really, really good times. In my opinion, I, because maybe I'm a little bit naive that because everyone's just saying like, oh, this art house is going to die. But so of course we have less and less theater, but I still do watch great films on the platforms. It's not only Netflix, but HBO, which is very active. For instance, in our region, like HBO Eastern Europe is very, very active, also in terms of co-productions and with documentaries and with series. So I think it's great. I do agree that it's great and it's a very good moment for content creators, for producers. But, uh, and I want them to stay because it's not just like a boom, no, the platforms and these startups that they're gonna, st that they stay also. But I just see as a risk on the next years to come if there's not taken as uh, independent producers and institutions in Europe as a challenge to compete with them because there can be an, a very big uh, uniformation of content and like very few players deciding and taking most of the talent. So I think as Europeans, it should be a, a way that we can give to content creators and uh, that we can create different things, not only what five people or like four big companies, because they're very powerful and money can buy many things. And uh, as a technicians, of course, there's a, it's hard to get technicians now in Spain for service, for, uh, for the big platforms, which is good because there's a lot of work, but then um, we as uh, local producers, when there's stories that are more local, that they're not in English, then it's, uh, it's hard to say someone like, you need to have a very good story, of course, but okay, they pay you 10, we pay you four, but uh, you know, it's very, so this happens, still happens, but I think there's, we need to think on the next years that we don't end up all doing uh, the same shows. Thanks, Ander. Yeah, I want to come back to the, to the streaming platforms. Um, it's a fact that um, the broadcasters and the dis distributors and the film theaters, they are losing the young audience. We're losing them. And I don't know what to, what to do at the moment, not to lose them. Um, because our audience as a broadcaster is getting older every year. It's, 
I think uh, the, the average viewer for ZDF program is 60 years old. And for an ARTA program, it's, uh, I think, uh, 58 or so. And um, what can we really do to reach a younger audience? And what can we do production-wise um, to help younger people go to the theater? Because I don't want this to die. I think we all don't want to uh, let uh, cinema die. It, it would be disastrous. So we have to really join forces, not against the Netflixes, but to be an alternative uh, in which way ever. I don't know. Can I just yes. say something about that? Uh, it's funny, Alexander, because I had a... There was a meeting last week in Dublin with the Screen Producers Union and we were talking about that very thing, about uh, public service broadcasting and, you know, is it dying? What, what are we going to do? Because younger people in Ireland don't really want to pay the TV license fee because they, they say that we don't watch TV. That's for old people. You know, we, we're on our phones, we're on our iPads. We, we don't, we're not interested in the national broadcaster anymore and the programs that they show. And so I, I think it, there really needs to be an awareness of how important public service broadcasting is because we can't lose it. I mean, it's so important for politics, for even children's TV, you know, all of these things that people don't think about. Classical radio stations, let's talk about getting rid of our classical radio station in Ireland, which will be travesty. You know, things like that. It, it, maybe there's a small audience, but it's, it's an important audience and they pay taxes too. So. I think that's a really good point, that there needs to be some kind of awareness and education to young people that, you know, not everybody gets cancer, but you still pay the health service. You pay your taxes towards the health service. Not everybody drives a car, but you still pay for the roads. We have to pay for media, for public service broadcasting. I think it's really important. I remember, perhaps hace two or three years, I remember a couple of years ago uh, a speech from the CNF, uh, the French CNF, that I really had an impact on me. Every year during uh, animation conventions or meeting, uh, France surprises us with uh, figures. This year, the, the 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 figure was that each euro invested in animation for uh, under 16, the return was of 16, uh, excuse me, now 10 euros back, and this is something quite amazing. Uh, a, a report about, from Stan Yan made by Ireland, the, it was for fiction, it, was, it came up to 3.5. And I remember there was a report uh, from the CNS where they said they prefer uh, spending much in animation and educating the younger audiences because at some point it's true that we'll lose them during their teenagehood, but they will be back and uh, in, they will be back in their way of understanding Europe and France. And, this is something that should just come to my mind, but uh, it's true that France has investing, is investing a lot of money in educating the younger audiences, and, and I'm not sure if they're being more and, or less successful than the others. Yes, I, I would like to add to, to all that has been said here. I agree with uh, that, that, the, that the platforms are not the enemy. They're, they're allies to all of us. At the same time, it's true that platforms are imposing contents or imposing a way of uh, or some themes, uh, subjects that, uh, yes, it's true that most of the time they come f outside, from outside of Europe, or that way perspective, their perspective is from outside Europe. So we, we need to be allies with uh, platforms because they, 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 the funding is, comes from them right now, but we have to fight for the contents that are made in Europe to be to be more from the in a uh, European context and a, and a European point of view, because if not, uh, it's true that at the end, uh, the, 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 the younger audiences, they, they just see, watch uh, US uh, films instead of watching European films. They have to keep their interest. And uh, with, regarding the audience, the, the, the 
Republic in Spain, the best uh, market quota is always when women have ch children and youth films and animation films. So we think that uh, young, younger people and mostly children with their, with their parents, they, are, they go to, to the movie theaters. And we, have, we don't have specific figures, but every year that the market quota is good, we know for, uh, for sure that there, that there are uh, animation or children films. So we need to create contents for that kind of uh, audience that goes to, this, to the theater. And, um, and teach them to learn to, to, to watch European films so with European content and not as much I mean uh, there's some series that are, that are totally made for, for North American teenagers and, uh, and for instance the, uh, a, a very well known plat uh, series that is in a, in a platform a series that's now in, internationalized I watched uh, one of the a chapter from the third season and it's totally Americanized. Now it used to be or it seemed a Spanish series and now it's, it looks like it's been made for a more international public. So it's important to work the platforms but we, have, we can't lose the perspective of the European culture to just to, 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 to maintain uh, preserve the audience in our film. Well, that reminded me of my niece. My niece is 13 years old. She's more Japanese than Japanese themselves. If she doesn't dye herself uh, her, the, the, her hair blue or, or dressed as Nemo, or, or not, she, she's not happy. She knows nothing about European films, but she can tell you the whole list of anima, animated films, and I'm not sure where she gets all this from. So this is very interesting, but uh, if, if you agree, we'll, we'll, we, I, I see uh, faces in the audience that uh, people want to, want to ask questions. We have somebody over there. Uh, yes, good morning. Thank you very much. This has been so interesting. Um, more of the uh, ex exhibition, I, I, of the uh, broadcasting. So I, I'm interested in, in the conversation. And this is just a comment to see if you can go a little bit deeper in that sense, mostly uh, regarding um, Mrs. Noro and her last comment. The idea of producing content for youth and families and to, in order to, to, to increase the audience. And it reminds me a field of dreams. It reminds me of this U.S. field of dreams. Let's build it and they will come. And I think it, I don't agree with this. Unfortunately, it's not like this. You have to go to the, audi to the audience, to your audience. You have to make uh, audiovisual education. You have to educate them. And this is, this is the work. The education and uh, work is, is not it's not enough. The, the cinema law is not developed, and I see there's more initiatives, and it's great to see this, but to take this to a more international, global level, I understand that the budget uh, capacity is always uh, uh, zero, and if, if, we, if we don't give money to develop in audiences, then there'll be less money for production. And maybe if you think in a very, in a bit naive way, if you think a bit of it ahead, you have to go deeper in the, in the senses and the directives of co-working, like under Alexander was mentioning, and co-working also from the production in, 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 in educating the audience. In, in, because it doesn't matter how much you content you create. Like you said, your, your, your niece, uh, we can create as, men, as much uh, fantastic European content as we want, but they won't get to know it. So I'd, 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 like, I'd like to know what they think and, um, and, and what they think about the funding and this need of funding and demanding uh, an intention regarding the development of, of the audiences of the produ produce uh, films. So what do you see, what do you think about the future, not to put the responsibility on the funding, but on what what is the what what well i i i'll just summarize the question how what, how do you see the possibilities on how how could we introduce demand or at least an intention of working on the audiences from the access to the funds to generate more content well from the ICA, uh, or IK, 
uh, we're not, uh, we, are, we belong to the culture and sports uh, department, government department. We would like to, uh, we would like the, for the schools to, 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 to just get, have a subject that is uh, audiovisual, just like music or plastic arts. So in the in the educational programs, we'd like to. It, it is important that they include them because any anybody can make a film these days with a with a phone. So it is important to educate from the basis, from the schools, and we are we we are encouraging this. We are working on educational programs, but from uh, ICA culture, we just don't have enough power to to pressure in this sense, but. Is it, this is one of our goals to 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 make possible to for for schools to have a, a, a audiovisuals and a, in schools. And I was I, yesterday I was talking to an, an, a co-producer and she says that, uh, uh, that in the school she had attended they had a they had a, this subject and this school doesn't exist anymore and uh, and, and and that's how her passion for film. Uh, started because they worked with films uh, at school and and made their own little productions on s special effects and they scratched them on the on the film and said and that sh and she started doing this at school and that's how her passion for film started so this is that's why it's important to start from the basis from school and we have to work on this together the society needs to demand uh, audiovisuals as a, as, a, as a subject in school just like any other subject a cultural subject any more questions? Yes, uh, education is really important and it's probably the main step to, to, to go back to the, to the relevance of uh, co European co-production and to create an, a, a, a work and the em emotional education uh, in, in Toulouse, uh, we saw a, a, a program about uh, ed sexual and emotional education uh, presented by Paloma Mora, who is here, and it was just a total su success or a bomb because she was teaching to the younger audiences uh, a reference uh, for, to learn about sex and affectivity and emotion. And not, they don't need to go to porn pages. And, and she was a pioneer in an, in, an, in an international environment, and now she is attracting the attention of European televisions and broadcasters. So there's a lot of work to do, and probably this, this will change the whole spectrum. More questions? Hello. Well, uh, it's not a question itself, but it's it's more a comment about Americanizing the Spanish series or not to do them in a in a global sense. Well, incidentally, I was in New York to promoting or creating about uh, film in, in Spain, and and, I, and 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 I had a lot of positive feedback about Spanish series, specifically uh, La Casa de Papel, the Paper House. Uh, people were really interested, uh, despite the Americanized uh, format of of the of the project. Uh, so uh, this is just an idea. How about uh, not seeing as, as, as Americanizing, Americanizing European culture, but to, to make European content accessible for America and for the world, to making it accessible to attract people from other nationalities. Excuse me, I, 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 didn't, I didn't understand the question. Ah. Well, uh, how about making the, the European content more accessible for uh, international audiences or public, thinking that in a, in the future, uh, the, the, this, it would be possible to make more European contact that is attractive for for and international for an international audience. In a little way already, especially with um, platforms like Netflix, there are a lot of sh European shows on there now, 
that people watch all over the world and people are getting more used to subtitles. Um, I don't know, in Spain, is, it, is dubbing more usual or subtitles dubbing? Um, I hate dubbing. Uh, subtitles, I think, are becoming more popular um, the world over, including America. And I think that's only going to be good for Europe because people are going to get more used to European shows and European languages. Um, I hope over the years. I know in Ireland we love subtitled shows. We get them all the time. Uh, we get the BBC channels and they usually come in through the BBC channels. Um, but our local broadcaster buys them as well. Um, so we have a long tradition of watching subtitled shows. So hopefully the Netflixes and the Amazons and the Apples and the iTunes will improve that. And subtitled shows will just keep going and improving and, and uh, getting more common, which is good for Europe.